So a few weeks ago, we published a video on British artist Roger Dean and some of the work he did for early video games, specifically their box art. And I mentioned in that video that we were testing it as part of a pilot for a longer series about video game cover art and the artists behind some of the more widely known titles. So to give you a little look at how the sausage is made, the four of us who currently make up the team at Subpixel all live in different states, and as such we have bi-monthly meetings on Discord to coordinate all our different creative endeavors and whatnot, and to pitch new ideas to one another. In our last meeting I pitched my idea for a continuing series on cover art, and Ian had a great idea to include an in-person segment wherein one of us would travel to a vintage game store, find an item in that store with the coolest cover design, and then take it home and research the artist. And initially I thought that was a great idea, until we tried to implement it. it turns out the Roger Dean video was something of a fluke, because Roger Dean already had immense notoriety when he began to work on video game box art, and as such his prestige merited that his name be attached to everything he worked on. Now over the years, as artists of all stripes began getting more and more involved in video game development and marketing, games cover artists were more regularly credited on the games themselves, but this is not the case for most vintage video game box art. On my trip to collect the pilot game for this new box art show, I visited Hudson's Video Games here in Orlando and collected Sega's classic Cyborg Justice. But then a problem manifested. Nowhere on the box, the game's manual, or the in-game credits is an artist for the cover art listed. So I turned to our handy friends at Google to see if the artist had since been tracked down, but was met by pages and pages of nothing. I even did a reverse image search to see if perhaps the artist had uploaded the cover to their own portfolio, but that too was a dead end. I had to get more creative. I went back into the game's manual to see if maybe someone who worked firsthand on the game, a producer or some such, might be able to point me in the right direction. I saw two options of possible candidates, producer Chris Smith and former Sega marketing director Scott Steinberg. Unfortunately for me, Chris Smith is a very common name, even amongst video game developers, and that led me down a short email thread with the wrong Chris Smith, though one who was arguably working on cool projects of his own, even if they hadn't worked on Cyborg Justice. Scott Steinberg was another story, though one that had become familiar to me as a person trying to crack through the walls surrounding this industry. Now, I, I understand why people don't have their personal emails or contacts contact info readily available, but how then does one contact them? At the time of recording this, Steinberg's current position is with Wargaming, the folks behind World of Tanks and a whole gamut of similar war-based MMOs. But Wargaming's website doesn't have a general contact line, just one for game-specific problems. So I decided to set Cyborg Justice aside for the moment, but my second attempt at this series concept was just as fruitless as the first, if not more so. I picked up Sega's Bomber Raid, which had even less credited information than Cyborg Justice. Obviously someone illustrated these covers, but who? Now I think the biggest issue at play here is the treatment of artists in the early days of the video game industry. It's obvious that there was a perception that, if the cover was not designed by someone on the immediate development team, that any game's box art was part of its marketing campaign. And as such, the artist or illustrator behind the cover was rarely credited anywhere on or in the actual game they helped to sell. The publishing company just chalked it up to a marketing expense, and likely the only place the artist's name exists is on the invoice for the commission, somewhere deep in rows and rows of filing cabinets in the basement of some industrial complex or another. And as it turns out, this was not just an issue isolated to cover artists, but has historically been a problem in all areas of game development. If you've watched our video on the history of collectibles in video games, you may recall that the first proper collectible and easter egg in a video game was in Atari's 1978 title, Adventure, where collecting a gray pixel would allow you access to a room containing the flashing text created by Warren Robinette. This easter egg room existed in direct defiance to a policy that existed at Atari at the time, where the famed publisher had decided not to list designers' names on the games they shipped. Whatever goal Atari had hoped to reach by enacting this policy, it backfired, leading Robinette and other designers at Atari to leave the company. Other companies too, like Sega, would often force their programmers to use pseudonyms in their game's credits, so as to not be poached by rival studios. They made it deliberately difficult to track down their employees, not anticipating that 40 years down the line some random content creator might want to make a YouTube video about the cover art for their game. All this is to say, for however brief this video might actually be, it is vastly important to accurately and fully credit the folks who work on games. You'd think that in 2020 we'd be over these kind of hurdles, but that is not the case. There is no industry-wide standard for crediting games workers. 
Rockstar Games famously, or infamously, had implemented a policy, official or not, that it would only credit employees who'd worked on a game if they were still part of the company when the game shipped. If you worked on a title and left before it shipped, you were off the final credit list. Now this led as many as 149 developers left off the end credits for Rockstar's L.A. Noir. Unlike the film industry, where the many, many unions of Hollywood's many trades fight for their members to be properly credited on the films they work on, the only people fighting for game devs are the devs themselves, and many of them have been bowled over by bigger, more powerful studios in the years since video games first made their mark on the world. Hopefully one day we'll actually be able to get this cover series off the ground, but until then I'll leave you with this. Not being in game dev myself, apart from fiddling around in game maker here and there, here is my plea to players. Be adamant about proper crediting in the games we play. If you've ever enjoyed a video game, that was the result of many hands assembling the various pieces of that game into the product that you eventually enjoyed. Those hands deserve credit. And to studios, please credit everyone who works on your titles, no matter at what point in their development, and no matter the breadth of their involvement. All work on a game deserves credit. Hey everybody, this is Jake Terrio with Subpixel. If you've made it this far, hopefully it means you enjoyed that video that you just watched. So if you could leave a like and a comment and subscribe if you're not subscribed already, that lets us and our robot overlords at YouTube know that this video is worth watching. So thank you for that, and we'll see you next time.